When Bernard Mandeville's Fable of the Bees was first published in 1714, it offered us the first written reference to the word gin. In his frank and detailed description of London's various vices and corruptions, Mandeville gives us one of the earliest insights into gin as a purely ruinous force. Nothing is more destructive, either in regard to the health or the vigilance and industry of the poor, than the infamous liquor, the name of which, derived from Junipera in Dutch, is now, by frequent use and the laconic spirit of the nation, of middling length shrunk into a monosyllable, intoxicating gin. Gin was based on a botanically infused juniper spirit known as Geneva, which had been produced in Belgium and the Netherlands for at least 200 years by this point, and enjoyed in the UK for around about 100 years. By 1714 though, through a combination of low cost, addictive qualities and massive social inequality, Geneva had morphed into gin and already had the poorest areas of central London in a death grip which was a position that was set to worsen through the first half of the 18th century, eventually arising into epidemic proportions. Londoners had begun to reinterpret Geneva by doing away with natural ingredients and replacing them with cheap and dangerous chemical compounds. Gin was sort of to Geneva what Mr Hyde was to Dr Jekyll, a terrifying and deadly corruption. The law meant it was cheap and easy to buy alcohol, and not at all difficult to produce some imitation Geneva. A lack of distilling expertise led to the London gin makers casually disregarding Dutch Geneva practices, and focusing instead on poorly made neutral alcohol with added ingredients to mask the impure and unpleasant flavour of these spirits. Gin became as cheap as beer, but packed a much bigger punch. One recipe from the 1740s, from Beaufoy, James and Co, who were actually a vinegar producer, doesn't even mention juniper. Oil of vitriol, oil of almonds, oil of turpentine, spirits of wine, lamp sugar, lime water, rose water, alum and salt of tartar. Slowly at first, but gathering pace, the overconsumption of gin became endemic. Far removed from the blithe alcoholism associated with beer and wine, it was perceived by those lucky enough to escape its clutches as purely abhorrent. Gin was the widespread social drug of the time that preyed upon the poor and vulnerable, gutting London from the inside out. Dr Stephen Hales, an anti-gin campaigner, wrote in 1734 that man has unhappily found means to extract from what God intended for his refreshment a most pernicious and intoxicating liquor. The population of London as a whole was relatively stagnant between 1725 and 1750. But this was only due to a steady influx of migrants. More people died in London during the mid-1700s than were being born, which is a statistical anomaly that thankfully hasn't repeated itself since. In the worst areas, a newborn had less than an 80% chance of making it to the age of two. Many families were forced to live in single rooms, in ramshackle tenements, or in damp cellars with no sanitation or fresh air. Drinking water was often contaminated by raw sewage, garbage was left rotting in the street. Problems with the disposal of the dead often added to the stench and decay. Many London graveyards became full to capacity and coffins were sometimes left partially uncovered in poor holes close to local houses and businesses. It's little wonder that the poor turned to gin as a release from the hardships of survival. Try to imagine every single newsagent, store, supermarket and street vendor in London, all turning their attention to selling gin. Then imagine it's cheaper than bread or milk and that anyone can buy it. Violent drunks, the elderly, infirm, children. Finally, imagine it's not only highly addictive, but poisonous, laced with added flavor enhancing properties that when consumed in large quantities cause blindness, death, or the loss of one's mind. It's easy to imagine widespread turmoil throughout the entire city, but dramming was really only centred around the poorest districts. In 1700, London had a population of 575,000, which made it the largest metropolis in Europe. While the residents of central London got drunk for literally a penny, the city of London can press on with business as usual, preoccupied and only vaguely aware of the horrors that are taking place around the corner. Gentlemen, politicians, merchants and scholars wouldn't venture into the fleshpots of Hoban or Shoreditch 
They would meet in nearby Cornhill to drink coffee, discuss politics, trade, the colonies, science or poetry. Perhaps some might indulge in a glass of gin on occasion, but it would be imported Holland's gin, not the ghastly stuff produced in some squalid basement in central London. The single biggest reason that the gin craze lasted so long, and its effects were so brutal, is the ignorance of the upper classes to see what was taking place under their noses. Thomas Fielding, a social historian of the time, wrote about the ravages of the gin craze on what he termed the inferior people in his 1751 political inquiry into the causes of the late increases in robberies. A new kind of drunkenness, unknown to our ancestors, is lately sprung up among us, and which, if not put to stop, will infallibly destroy a great part of the inferior people. The drunkenness I here intend is by this poison called gin, the principal substance, if it may be called, of more than a hundred thousand people in this metropolis. If the gin craze was a storm, then the area of St Giles in the Fields near Charing Cross Road was the centre of the deluge. Renowned as one of the country's biggest slums, for the 20,000 people living there, gin was a simple, cheap and accessible solution to all of their problems. As you might imagine, there are no shortage of harrowing stories from the period, and as a researcher it becomes a macabre process of selection, sifting through the fallout and singling out the accounts that best represent the grim horror of the gin craze. William Hogarth's gin lane etching might seem a grisly exaggeration of events, but the true plight of the people embroiled in the gin craze was perhaps even worse. One of the most disturbing and notorious tales from the period is of Judith Dufour. In 1734, she deposited her unclothed two-year-old daughter, Mary, at the workhouse where she was employed, then returned the following day, hungover, to claim her. Now fully clothed, she stripped the child of her clothes, then strangled her to death, dumped her body in a ditch. She then sold the clothes for one shilling and four pence and used her earnings to buy gin. Spare a thought too for Joseph Barrett, he was a 42-year-old labourer who was hung in 1728 for beating his son to death. Barrett's final confession is a harrowing account of how his son, James, spent his days begging for money and his nights, drinking until he appeared worse than a beast, quite out of his senses. Garrett apparently had no evil intention and planned only to reclaim James from his wild courses. Barrett's punishment was too savage, however, and James died in his bed. He was 11 years old. By 1751, half of all the British wheat harvest was used to make spirits. There were reportedly 17,000 private gin shops in London, and almost half of them were in Hoban. That's approximately one shop for every black cab in Greater London today, and that figure only represents the gin specialists. It doesn't include all the taverns and public houses that also sold gin by the bucket load. Neither does it include the street markets, grocers, chandlers, barbers, barrows and brothels that also did a roaring trade in gin. Some estimates, and they can really only be estimates, suggest that over 10 million gallons of gin were consumed in London in 1751. That's a worthy effort for a population of only 700,000 helped along by the fact that many factory workers were partly paid in gin. Follow the maths down and you're looking at a bottle of gin per week per person. The novelist Henry Fielding argued that there would soon be few of the common people left to drink it if the situation continued. Poets, playwrights, journalists turned their attention to the scourge, publicly voicing their concerns over the parasite that was gnawing away at London's underbelly. It was in 1751, at the height of the gin craze, that William Hogarth unveiled his remarkable Gin Lane etching. Burdened with ghastly imagery, the scene was designed to shock all who laid eyes on it. Serving as a morbid checklist of gin's combined misdemeanours, social decay, drunkenness, depression, violence, infanticide, suicide and madness. Gin Lane is the most prominent piece of satire to emerge from the gin craze and undoubtedly one of the more effective weapons in Gin's undoing. Gin Lane is certainly worthy of a few minutes close inspection where the most observant of you 
we'll find countless subplots in the wider story of Jin's destructive force. In the foreground, we are naturally drawn to the image of the inebriated mother, cheerfully oblivious to the fact that she has dropped her child in favour of her snuffbox. In front of her sits a skeletal man clutching a flagon of gin and a ballad entitled The Downfall of Madame Gins, its objective plainly fallen by the wayside. Behind and to the right, an elderly woman is fed gin from her position in a barrow. Meanwhile, a pair of St Giles orphans share a dram while people outside a distillery riot. The pawnbroker on the left is doing a roaring trade as his three-sphered sign forms a cross above the distant Bloomsbury church spire and the message is clear. The people of Gin Lane have put their faith in an altogether different spirit.